Today on the Matt Wall Show, schools in Virginia will soon be expelling students as young as kindergarten for the crime of, quote, malicious misgendering. Also, the new White House press secretary is black and gay and expects to be applauded for it. She also happens to be terrible at her job. Democrats say it's a racist conspiracy theory that they hate so-called whiteness, but we'll listen to their actual words on the subject today. Plus, Eric Swalwell brags about being a terrible parent. A TikToker attempts to answer the what is a woman question, but she does it in the form of a poem. And in our daily cancellation, we deal with the new phenomenon known as land acknowledgments. We'll talk about all of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, to avoid public criticism and peer pressure, would you compromise your principles to blend in with the crowd? Or would you stand for what you believe? In 2020, NBA rising star Jonathan Isaac faced that very question. And amid pro basketball's league-wide protest against racial injustice, Jonathan became one of the only players not to kneel for the national anthem. In his new book, Why I Stand, pu published with the uh, Daily Wire's DW Books, Jonathan shares how his experiences in faith shaped who he is and his perspective on the world. So if you want to hear the story behind the stand, and gain inspiration and strength to uphold your own convictions, pick up a copy of Why I Stand by Jonathan Isaac, out now, wherever you buy books. So I want to begin by reflecting again on one moment in the What is a Woman trailer that we played yesterday on the show. Uh, one of the people we interviewed, Scott Nugent, is a female who, uh, as she says, medically transitioned to appear like a male, but will never actually be a man. Uh, now, she, she speaks out now quite bravely about her own horrific experiences with medical transition, and warns against, most especially, the drugging and mutilation of children. In the trailer, which you can watch at whatisawoman.com, Nugent says, it got me at 42, your child doesn't stand a chance. And as I said yesterday, you know, we should understand that your child doesn't understand a chance, and it referring to, you know, gender ideology, uh, but your child doesn't, doesn't stand a chance is not meant to be a literal guarantee that all of our children are going to be indoctrinated into the trans cult against our will. We can protect our kids against that, and we must. The point is to emphasize just how powerful the forces aligned against the youngest generations actually are. Now, we often lament that kids in school, for example, are exposed to things that only adults should be exposed to. But it's actually worse than that. They are, in fact, subjected to things that even adults are not subjected to. Actually, the adults who, who choose to subject our kids to these things don't want to be subjected themselves to the very same thing. So case in point, a mom this week confronted the Clark County School Board in Las Vegas about pornographic material that her daughter was forced to, wasn't just assigned to her, she was forced to memorize this and present it to her class. And listen to how the school board responds, though. Listen to this. I'm going to read you an assignment given to my 15-year-old daughter at a local high school. This will be horrifying for me to read to you, but that will give you perspective on how she must have felt when her teacher required her to memorize this and to act it out in front of her entire class. I don't love you. It's not you. It's just, I don't like your dick or any dick in that case. I cheated, Joe. I'm sorry. This is propaganda. That Forgive me. Put excuse, me. excuse me. I, I don't. Thank you so much for your. Thank you for your uh, comment. Forgive me. I, we're not using profanity. Are you? Okay. We have the time back. That's relevant. I should be talking. Okay. The teacher this, this, required my daughter to read, memorize this, and read this pornographic material. Uh, excuse me. Please don't engage with the audience. Okay. Uh, sorry, so my please continue your public comment. Your your time is. You've got one, one minute and 19 seconds. Um, I ask you simply, this is a public meeting. I ask for decorum, um, and I'm asking Dr. Jara. Thank you so much. Dr. Jara? I just, if you don't want me to read it to you, what was that like for my 15-year-old daughter to have to memorize pornographic material? So you hear someone in the audience first cuts her off and says, this is propaganda. It's prop I mean, it is propaganda, but it's the propaganda being given to kids in school. And immediately after the mother there at the microphone uh, said what you heard her say at the end, which is, if you don't want to hear it, then why are we giving it to kids? They cut her microphone. They, the adults on the school board, did not want to have to hear profanity and sexual vulgarities, but they don't mind if 15-year-old kids are exposed to it. So just think about that for a moment. There, there are things that kids are subjected to in schools, which would be considered not only inappropriate, but 
potentially sometimes illegal anywhere else in society. Adults are able to say things to kids in school, make them do things that in any other context would lead to that adult being arrested. If you walked up to a child that was walking down the sidewalk and you, you handed her the material that the mother in that video was reading, you'd go to jail. But a teacher can assign it as a mandatory classroom activity and the school board will take a don't ask, don't tell approach to it. I don't care if the kids have to hear that, but don't make me listen to it, they say. No, um, kids in school aren't being treated like adults. That would be bad enough. The actual situation is worse. Here's another example from today. Fox News reports, the school board of Fairfax County Public Schools in Fairfax, Virginia, is reviewing updated rules that could potentially expose students to suspension or expulsion for, quote, maliciously misgendering their peers based on, quote, frequency and intensity. Now, you got to worry about the intensity of the misgendering. The Fairfax County Public Schools Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, which will be voted on May 26th, includes in its updated version rules that uh, make malicious deadnaming and malicious misgendering of classmates a level four offense, which allows for a suspension of up to five days if frequency and intensity are present, according to page 19 of the document. Using slurs based upon the actual or perceived gender identity is forbidden under the rules of the document, quote, which includes, but is not limited to, malicious deadnaming or malicious misgendering. Now, malicious misgendering may sound like the name of, a, of an indie band, but actually it refers to the crime of using a grammatically correct pronoun to refer to a gender-confused person. And dead naming, of course, means using the name their parents gave them rather than whatever name they made up for their new alter ego. This is a level four offense. The good news is that it's not a level five offense, which means that it's not quite placed on the same level as homicide and sexual assault. So Fairfax, in this way, is slightly less insane in the school district in Wisconsin that we talked about yesterday that's charging three boys with sexual harassment for failing to refer to a quote-unquote non-binary student with they-them pronouns. So this, what, what's happening in Fairfax is actually not as bad as what's happening in other schools. But the bad news is that level four puts misgendering on the same tier as assault, theft, and arson. So you could like set the school on fire and uh, or you could refer to a boy as a he. And it's, you know, tomato, tomato. It's the same thing. And the even worse news is that students all the way down to kindergarten will be sub subjected and subject to these rules and then the prescribed penalties, which include lengthy suspension, suspensions or even expulsion. This puts a moral burden on little kids in elementary school that the vast majority of adults have never had to endure. I've never had to endure. Because they're being compelled to lie under threat of immediate and severe punishment. I've never quite been in a situation like that, have you? They must choose between the truth or their academic futures. Like, it's like a seven-year-old kid is, is faced with that. Very few adults have shown the resolve, fortitude, courage to stand by the truth on this issue or any other issue, even when the consequence is merely an unpleasant look or an uncomfortable interaction. Most adults have shown that they will respect the pronoun, even if they'd prefer not to, simply because they're afraid of confrontation. They're afraid of awkwardness. There could be nothing else. There, 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 there could be uh, no other potential consequence other than that. And most adults will just go along with it. How many children will have the strength to speak the truth, retain their sanity, when the consequence will be not only social alienation, but also severe administrative punishments? Now, the rule does stipulate that only malicious misgendering incidents will uh, be punished. And this gives the kids a little leeway in case they, you know, make the mistake of accidentally using proper grammar. Might also give them a little bit of grace if they, uh, if they have trouble keeping up with their classmates who have a gender identity that changes five times a day. But if it's decided that proper grammar was used intentionally, God forbid, then the consequences will be swift and dire. Now, when I was a kid, students with a demonstrable grasp on the rules of grammar were awarded with like high grades and little encouraging stickers on their assignments. Now those students are expelled. And how will the administration even know if the misgendering was intentional or not? Well, that'll be up to their kangaroo courts to determine. Of course, 
malicious and intentional are seen as one and the same here. It's been decided that the only reason why anybody would ever intentionally use male pronouns when referring to a male who wants to be a female is that they're trying to hurt the person. The possibility that somebody would misgender, i.e. correctly gender, not because they want to hurt anybody, but because they value the truth and because they realize that cooperating with and affirming confusion only causes more harm to the confused individual, that possibility is discounted. It doesn't exist as far as the Fairfax schools are concerned. Now, the effect here is, first and foremost, of course, that kids are mentally beaten into submission until they finally accept the tenets of gender ideology, not because they understand the tenets or believe them, but because they're afraid, understandably afraid, and they lack the energy or the will to deal with the consequences of not accepting what they're being told to accept. But another effect, just as intentional, but less often discussed, is that kids are, are being turned against each other. Terry Schilling of the Claremont Institute made this point on Twitter about this story. I thought it was a good point. That these kinds of policies are, on top of everything else, yet another way to sow division and suspicion and resentment within the student population, among the kids themselves. It's announced from on high that any student who intentionally fails to use preferred pronouns is malicious and deserving of the harshest possible penalties. This is a message and word of warning, not just to those heretical students, but to all the other kids as well. It's a big red arrow pointed at the heretics saying, these people are bad. They hate you. You should hate them too. That's the announcement. Don't try to see the best in people. Don't give any grace. Don't try to understand things from their perspective. Oh no, not that. No, if they don't do what you want them to do, Report them to the authorities and destroy their lives. That's the message. The environment that's fostered. So your kids don't stand a chance? Well, if they're abandoned to a system like this, left to their own devices to navigate it, their chances of surviving with their souls and minds intact may not be zero. But the chances aren't great. That's for certain. Now let's get to our five headlines. You know, cryptocurrency may represent the future of money. It's one of the most exciting investments opportunities to come around for some time. But what about taxes? With an Alto Crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Get into investing in crypto and do it in a tax advantage retirement account. Alto's Crypto IRA is the easy way to get crypto into an IRA. Trade all you want without the tax headache. Create an account in just a few minutes and invest with as little as $10. No setup charges needed. There are multiple ways to fund your account. You can uh, make a cash contribution. You can transfer cash from an existing IRA or you can roll over an old 401k. So it's very easy to do. You also have secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. There are 80 plus coins available, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. Uh, all you got to do is open an Alto Crypto IRA account with as little as $10. And uh, that means just go to altoira.com slash Matt. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash Matt. Go again to altoira.com slash Matt. So the new White House spokeswoman took over for Jen Psaki yesterday, had her very first uh, uh, White House press conference. And her name is Karen Jean Pear. That's how I'm going to pronounce it anyway. And uh, this is how Karen Jean Pear introduced herself. Let's listen. I am obviously acutely aware uh, that my presence at this podium uh, represents a few firsts. Uh, I am a black gay immigrant woman, the first of all three of those to hold this position. I would not be here today if it were not for generations of barriers, pe barrier breaking people before me. I stand on their shoulders. If, if it were not for generations of barrier, barrier breaking people before me, I would not be here. But um, I benefit from their sacrifices. I have learned from their ex ex excellence, and I am forever grateful to them. Representation does matter. You hear us, you hear us say this uh, often in this administration, and no one understands this better than President Biden. Well, that's a totally normal thing, right? It's just, uh, you, you know, you're getting up there. It's, a, it's the White House. It's a press conference. And the first thing you do is announce... Um, your sexual orientation. Hey, just so you all know, um, 
I have sex with women, just in case. I just I wanted to. We we're sitting here at the White House, and I thought everyone should know that. So here you go. I like how she, she's thanking her forebears. You know, <laughs> I want to thank all the lesbian press secretaries that came before me. I stand on the shoulders of uh, lesbian secretaries. It's just an entire mountain of them that I stand atop. She's truly the, the Jackie Robinson of gay press secretaries. Well, never mind, actually, because uh, Jackie Robinson was great at his job. And that's the thing we often forget is that um, Jackie Robinson was great. And that's why he's remembered. Uh, that's why he achieved everything that he did. He broke the color barrier and was great. So he earned his way in and then he dominated. And that's the thing that's always missing. You know, from, from these kinds of conversations where we talk about the first person the, uh, the first person to do this or that. Well, it used to be you were celebrated if you were the first and also great. If you were the first and you sucked at it, then like nobody cares. No one's going to remember. That's not an accomplishment. That's actually worse. So if you're going to be the first to do something and then be bad at it, it'd be better off if you didn't do it at all. What if Jackie Robinson had gotten in there and just and and he was awful and it flunked out, you know? Couldn't couldn't hack it in the league. So if I was even tempted to possibly celebrate you for being the first of any kind of person to do something, you need to actually be good at it. Now, in this case, the fact that you're the first gay black female press secretary is irrelevant. I mean, it's neither interesting nor important, um, even if you're good at your job. But I just I hate how this question of skill has been completely ignored. It's just been ruled out. We're supposed to celebrate people ahead of time, no matter how, no, no matter if they're good or not, no matter what they actually do in that position. In fact, she then demonstrated that she certainly um, did not get the job because of her abilities, unfortunately. So listen to this exchange where she tries to explain why raising taxes will lower inflation. This is the claim that Biden had made, which is that if, by raising taxes, it's going to help fix inflation, which is is totally incoherent, of course. But um, and it's a, it's an indefensible proposition. But you're the press secretary. Literally, your job is to defend the indefensible, especially if you're the press secretary for Joe Biden. So let's hear how she does. Look, you know, we have talked about um, we have talked about this this past year uh, about um, making sure that the wealthiest among us are paying their fair share, um, and that is important to do. And uh, that is something that uh, you know the president has been you know working on uh, every day when we talk about inflation and lowering costs. And so it's very important uh, that uh, you know as we're seeing costs rise, uh, as we're talking about how to you know uh, you know build a, a, a America that's safe, that's equal for everyone and doesn't leave everyone behind, that is an important part of that as well. But how does raising taxes on corporations lower the cost of gas, the cost of a used car, the cost of food for everyday Americans? So look, I think we encourage those who have done very well right, especially those who care about climate change uh, to support a fair ta tax code that doesn't change, that doesn't charge manufacturers, workers, cops, builders, a higher percentage of their earnings, that the most fortunate people in our nation and not let this, this, that stand in the way of reducing energy costs and fighting this ex existential problem, if you think about that as an example, and to support basic collective bargaining rights as well, right, that's also important. But look, it is, you know, by not, if, without having a fair tax code, which is what I'm talking about, then all, every, like manufacturing workers, cops, you know, it's not fair for them to have to pay higher taxes than the folks that, who are, who are, who are not paying taxes at all. That's, I, that's, uh, that's hard to watch. I mean, visibly rifling through her notes, kind of panicked, like, what am I supposed to say here? Reading lines that have nothing to do with the question she was asked. Because, again, the question was, how does raising taxes help lower inflation? question isn't about, uh, is, it, is it good to raise taxes? Is everybody paying their fair share? Whatever nonsense. That's not the question. The question is, does it lower inflation? Because that's the claim that Joe Biden made. 
And that's her performance. Now, I get that being press secretary is actually a very hard job. You're constantly lying. You can never give a straight answer to anything. At least that's what the job has become, right? Um, now, I think once you've finally deadened and silenced your conscience, it becomes probably easier. And if you go into it with no conscience at all, then um, it's it's even easier. That was, I think, Jen Psaki's great advantage. But uh, still, it's uh, it it that's no excuse for being that bad at it. Now, if it were me and I was asked, hey, why did the president say that raising taxes will fix inflation? I would just say, well, because he was lying and people don't like paying taxes. And so he was just trying to think of a way to make it more appealing to people. And lots of people are stupid and so they'll buy it. That's the reason. But I wouldn't have the job for very long. So I know you can't, you can't say that. I, I get it. But your job is to say a bunch of stuff where you're not really saying anything, but it sounds like you're saying something. That's essentially the job. And there is a certain skill involved there, which Karen Jean Pair just doesn't have at all. Uh, she was also asked, as we move on here um, to Buffalo, she was asked why Biden is going to Buffalo, but as we pointed out yesterday, did not go to Waukesha. And here's her answer to that. How come the president is visiting Buffalo after a senseless tragedy there, but he couldn't visit Waukesha after six were killed and 61 injured in an attack on a Christmas parade there? I mean, he's visited many communities. Buffalo, he was, we, you know, he was, he's able to go tomorrow to Buffalo uh, uh, before the trip. That is something that was important for him to do. But he has visited many, uh, many other communities. This is not, Buffalo is not the first community, sadly, that he has to go up to. Uh, because of a violent attack. So, you know, that's not that's not the first one. So he's been to many others. Well, right. No one said that he's never visited communities before. She reminds me of my kids. You know, if I'm like, hey, Luke, you didn't clean your room when I told you to. Why, why didn't you clean your room? Daddy, I cleared the table yesterday after dinner. What does that have to do with cleaning your room, though? That's not, yeah, I understand that you've done chores in the past I've told you to, but that's not the chore I ask you to do specifically right now. So in this case, she says, uh, well, he's, he's, he's gone to plenty of communities. He's gone to May. He's gone to, I mean, dozens and dozens of communities in his life, probably hundreds of communities. There are so many communities that Joe Biden has been to. I, I could list them all, but it's just there's so many I couldn't even list them. Well, we understand that, but that, that actually only further um, underscores the point that he didn't go to Waukesha. So responding to that by saying, oh, he's, he goes to communities all the time. He's always visiting communities. Well, that just makes it worse, don't you see, Karen Jean Pair? It makes it worse because he didn't go to Waukesha. So he goes to communities all the time, especially ones where there's a, some sort of a, a mass attack. Didn't go to Waukesha. Why is that? Well, we know the answer, and I know it's the answer she can't give. But the actual answer is that the victims were white. And so Democrats, they just don't care about that. Um, speaking of Buffalo, I want, you, I want you to listen to what this reporter says when asking Karen Jean Pair about the so-called great replacement theory. Just listen to the, uh, the words that are used here. Very, very telling. Listen. There's polling that shows one in three Americans believe in some element of replacement theory. You just spoke in very broad brushstrokes there. Are there specifics that this White House is willing to do, willing to take in order to stop this form of thinking from further seeping out of the fringe and into the mainstream? So, you know, we're going to continue to call this out. Um, as we have uh, talked about many times, uh, the president, at, at, at every chance he's had, when we've seen a, a violent uh, attack like this, that is, uh, uh, that is, as we, you know, say, with hatred um, and racially motivated, he calls it out and, and calls it what it is. What are we going to do to stop this form of thinking? They're not even trying to hide it. How are we going to stop? There's somebody in the press asking this, by the way. How are we going to stop people from thinking like this? And thinking like what exactly? I mean, what is the form of thinking? Well, it's this, uh, it's uh, the, the so-called great replacement theory. And one of the clips I want to play for you on this, and then, uh, and then I have a, a couple, ex actually, I have some examples, in fact, of the great replacement theory that I want to present to you. But first, here's Chuck Schumer on the floor of the Senate yesterday, also railing. And we, there are so many examples we could pull from because this, is, this has been... 
uh, the current thing for the Democrats over the last couple of days is the uh, the great replacement theory, which they're accusing Republicans of engaging in. And so here's just one example. Chuck Schumer on the floor of the Senate railing about it. Listen. This is replacement theory in a nutshell. It is dangerous and a deeply anti-American worldview. It is poisoning minds, people's minds, who spend hours wandering the darkest wastelands of the Internet. And let's be clear, it's a message that has also found a special home in several right-wing outlets and on one cable news channel in particular, Fox News. In a craven quest for viewers and ratings, organizations like Fox News have spent years perfecting the craft of stoking cultural grievance and political resentment. Stoking grievance and resentment is, of course, all these people do. That is their entire MO. That's their entire political strategy. They have nothing else to offer. They don't do anything but that. It's just stoke, especially racial grievance and resentment, uh, while he accuses everybody else of doing that. Now, the, 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 what is the theory here? Well, as I pointed out yesterday, it, it, this, this actually is a theory from the Democrats, and their theory is that Whiteness, generally speaking, um, is something that can be and should be uh, mitigated. It, like like it's, it's a disease. That's the theory on the left, is that whiteness is a disease that needs to be cured. And I mean that in a very literal sense. So I'll just give you one example here. Um, a guy by the name of Donald Moss wrote, uh, a paper, this was just last year, wrote a paper for the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And we could put this up there for you. This is just, just the abstract of this paper. This is what he writes. And this, by the way, is totally in keeping with CRT. I mean, this is basically CRT with a little bit of, of uh, psychobabble, a little bit of extra psychobabble added in. So this is what Donald Moss says. Whiteness is a condition one first acquires, and then one has a malignant parasitic-like condition to which white people have a particular susceptibility. The condition is foundational, generating characteristic ways of being in one's body, in one's mind, and in one's world. Parasitic whiteness renders its host's appetites voracious, insatiable, and perverse. These deformed appetites particularly target non-white peoples. Once established, these appetites are nearly impossible to eliminate. Effective treatment consists of a combination of psychic and social historical interventions. Such interventions can reasonably aim only to reshape whiteness's infiltrated appetites to reduce their intensity, redistribute their aims, and occasionally turn those aims toward the work of reparation. And then we go forward a little bit, and it says, um, there is not yet a permanent cure. So this is the... Again, totally consistent. This is not just some fringe concept. Totally consistent with CRT. This, this way of thinking is, there's a reason why it was published in the psychoanalytic journal. It's all over the psychology, uh, psychology and psychiatry industry. And he is quite literally saying that whiteness is a parasitic condition for which it is necessary that we find a permanent cure. You find this in the media too. Uh, here's this from, this is Jennifer Rubin at the Washington Post. Um, somewhat infamous tweet from last year. And she was responding to census data, which, 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 which showed at the time, and as we, we've seen this in, in successive um, census reports, the number of white people falls for the first time. So she's responding to a headline which says, census data shows widening diversity, number of white people falls for the first time. Jennifer Rubin's response, a more diverse, more inclusive society. This is fabulous news. Now we need to prevent minority white rule. So, she is responding specifically to a headline that says the, the number of white people f falls for the first time. She says, fabulous news. Now, if, if for some reason it's not immediately obvious why, this, why that's a horrific thing to say, all you have to imagine is if the headline had said, number of black people falls, and then someone had responded and said, fabulous news. So, if anyone in media responded that way to um, the hypothetical headline saying that the number of black people falls, that person would be done forever. Like their career is over, it's destroyed. There would be 
100% agreement among everyone everywhere that that is very racist. And it would be, of course. Like, if you're cheering for the, for the, for the population of a certain race to dwindle, then that's, that's racist. Like, I can't think of a, a more racist thing than that. And this is what you get on the left. Um, another example, this is from uh, Hollywood producer Morgan J. Freeman. We have a couple of tweets from him. Not to be confused with, not that Morgan Freeman, not the, fam- not the famous one, the different one. Um, he says, be- and this is just today, or yesterday he tweeted this. Being anti-racist starts by admitting whiteness is a disease. Whiteness is a dominant cultural space with enormous political significance with the purpose to keep others on the margin. So it's a disease, whiteness is a disease, we got to get rid of it, so on and so forth. Now, um, so this is the game they play. First of all, again, the theory that whiteness is a disease, a problem, and we have to minimize it, mitigate it, replace it, um, that is the theory on the left. And if you notice it, but if you simply notice what they're saying, and then you point to it and say, hey, did you hear what that person just said? Then all of a sudden, you're the conspiracy theorist. This is the game they play. Um, to great effect, in fact. They just scare people into, uh, into silence. And they create this environment where they can, of course, say whatever they want. Uh, but then they also get to decide... You know, they could just say what they want, and uh, but if, if in certain circumstances, they might not want you to quote them. They might not want you to notice what they're doing, even when they're explicit about it. And so they get to decide. Eric Swalwell had some thoughts about, uh, about the Buffalo Massacre as well. Let's put this tweet up there. He says, my four-year-old just FaceTimed to ask what I'm doing to help the people in Buffalo. And why did the bad man do this? Absolutely gutting. This cannot be his normal. It's time to ban assault weapons, hashtag end gun violence. Now, there's a follow-up. We'll put it up in a second. Uh, but this is, this is, of course, the meme that Eric Swalwell is, is, uh, is doing here, which is the common thing you find, especially on the left, that like no matter how often this is relentlessly mocked, they keep doing it, where they put, wor- they put their own words into the mouths of their, of their children, and then they do this, oh, my child just came up to me and said this doesn't matter how often we make fun of this. They just keep on doing it. And the thing is, very often when they make up these stories about what their kids have said, we're actually doing them a favor by assuming that they're making it up. Because if they're not making it up, then it means that they're abusive. It means that they're either they're liars or they're terrible parents. So it's almost like for your own sake, I'm going to assume, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume your kid didn't say that. Like, like in this case, your four-year-old? Why would your four-year-old know about a mass shooting in Buffalo? Why would you tell your four-year-old that? I have a five-year-old at home. It would never occur to me to turn the news on and say, hey, uh, hey, come, come on in here, son, and, and watch this. There's a, there's a mass shooting in Buffalo. Let me tell you all about it. Now, the thing about being a very young kid is that you, if, you've, if you have good parents anyway, you can just be a kid. And you don't have to live um, with the awareness of, of all of the, the most horrible things that are happening in the world. There's, there'll be time for that later on in life, but not right now. So a lot of people accused Eric Swalwell of making this up, and he wanted us to know that he didn't make it up. So he, uh, he followed up with, put the follow tweet up there. I love the, uh, the no four-year-old would ask this takes. You're an absolute denial if you think our kids aren't watching the horrors that we're allowing. And then, he, and then he shows the text message exchange, whereas I guess it's his wife. And that's kind of confusing because uh, his, his wife texts him. He wants to know if you're going to help the family of the people who died at the supermarket massacre. And then there's a picture of a kid watching the news, watching CNN. But the kid is, has a bow in the hair and is wearing a dress. So is Eric Swalwell dr- dressing his son up like a girl or is that his daughter? Who knows? I mean, I, I wouldn't put it past him, of course. So he's dunking on us by, by, he's sort of debunking our claims that he's lying by saying, no, no, I actually am a terrible parent, and I do tell my four-year-old about these kinds of things. Okay, well, have it your way, Swalwell. 
You're a terrible parent then. I'm, I'm, I'm fine believing that. Totally believable. All right. Uh, one other clip I want to play for you on a more positive note. Here's Republican Senator James Lankford yesterday on the floor of the Senate uh, making a point that may sound familiar if you listen to this show, but still an important point. Let's listen. You know, it's federal law right now that we protect turtle eggs. Turtles, if you destroy a turtle egg, it's a federal offense with a very big fine. If you destroy an eagle egg, it's a very big offense with a federal fine. Do you find that odd? And I'm just in dialogue with this person. Do you find that odd that in federal law we protect an eagle egg, acknowledging that's an eagle inside that egg, and we protect a turtle egg, saying we acknowledge that's a turtle inside that egg, but we allow the destruction of children. And to my shock, they responded, well, turtles and eagles are endangered. So they should be protected. And I'm called the extremist. Uh, it's, this is a point that should be, I'm, I'm glad he brought it up on the floor of the Senate because this is a point that uh, should be made that we should, that we should keep making because especially, now we could talk about the endangered species as we did on the show, but um, the most important thing to bring up is like, no, it's not just, it's not just, it's, it's bad enough if turtles that are walking around in the sand, you know, if they're protected more than babies are, which they are, but it's, it's also in their embryonic form. They are not only protected, but legally recognized. That's the point here. A, an embryonic turtle is legally recognized as a turtle. And yet, an embryonic human is not legally recognized as a human. That's the point. And so you can't escape that point by saying, well, turtles are endangered. So they're endangered, so they does that change what they what they fundamentally, biologically are. Because they're endangered, then they, they still count as turtles when they're in their amniotic phase, but, but humans, that doesn't make any sense. And also, just a, another point on this endangered thing. Aren't we told that human beings are also endangered? Now, I'm pretty sure I've been, I've been reliably informed by Alexandria Caso cortez and many others that we actually, not only are we endangered, but we have... I don't know. They said it was 12 years, and then it, it keeps changing. But it's in fact, it, 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 interestingly enough, it's all. It always seems to be about 10 to 12 years is, is the amount of time we have to live left on this planet. And then, but it's always 10 years in the future. So it's 10 years in the future right now, and then we're going to get to 10 years from now. It'll be it'll be uh, 2032, and it was, well, still we still have 10 years left. But one way or another, we have 10 years left because of climate change. So we're endangered, also, aren't we? But that's, again, kind of irrelevant because the point, it's just a, it's a logical contradiction here. Does a, does a, a creature at its earliest phases of existence, is that, is that a, is that a different category? Is it like a, almost a different species or is it the same species, the same category? Just in a, di- in, in its earliest phase of development. I mean, which is it? That's the question that they have to confront. All right, one other thing I want to play for you. This is a, before we get to the comment section, this is a TikTok video that somebody sent to me. Um, and here is someone attempting to answer the question of what is a woman. And not only are they answering it, but they're doing it, <clears throat> thankfully, in the form of poetry. So let's listen to this. You know what question really frustrates me? What is a woman? So I wrote a poem. What is a woman? How do you define? Are we the sum of our parts or is it more refined? Must we be feminine or dress all in pink? Is it how we dress and act or how we think? Is it our bodies that make us a she? Is it our DNA, our biology? Yet there are women who have no uterus, no breasts, who cannot give birth. Do we call them less? So it's not nature organs or dress, how do we define what a woman is best? A woman is someone who decides who she is. It's not an answer on some imaginary quiz. Some women are strong. Some women feel small. Some women are so hurt they feel nothing at all. Some women are alone. Some women are mothers. 
Some women are vengeful, some women are lovers. Womanhood is more than a box we fit in. We don't owe an answer to questions asked with a smug grin. We owe no explanation, we aren't here to appease. We are women, we will be who we please. Hope you guys liked it, love and light. I wish that someone, when we were shooting the film, had had uh, broken out into poetry for me because that would have been great. That's the one thing. I, I told you there's a lot of stuff in this film, a lot of shocking moments, but no, we, I didn't get any poetry, so I'm a little bit upset about that. Uh, maybe we can add, add that to a credit sequence or something in the film. I don't know. But um, that's that's her attempt at an answer. And it, it is, even though she she takes the poetry approach, it is, it's exactly what everyone does, of course, where... She's just adding a whole bunch of words, but then it comes down and you're waiting and you're waiting. I don't know about you, but I was on the, I was on the edge of my seat there, uh, metaphorically anyway, listening like, okay, we, it's, it's all the poetry and the rhyming, very nice. Are we going to get to an answer at the end? We get to the last stanza. Are you going to finally have the answer? And, uh, but at the very end, it's, no, there's no answer. So all of that to come down to the conclusion of, oh, I have no idea. I don't know what a woman is. A woman is, uh, well, is anything they please. That doesn't help us at all. It's also, of course, not true. Okay, you can't, you, no, nobody can be literally anything they want to be. So, but putting that aside for a second, it doesn't actually answer the question. So a lot of dancing around it, but at least you danced around in the form of a rhyme. So I can appreciate that. Well, it's finally happened. The Fed is realizing the dire straits that our economy is in thanks to our loose monetary policy. Apparently, you can't just spend trillions every year with no repercussions. Who would have thought? Now to play catch up, the Fed has been raising rates and plans to, plans to raise them seven times this year alone. You're already starting to see those ripple effects in the housing market as people's buying power diminishes. Have you considered what could happen in the stock market if our economy stalls out? Don't wait till that happens. Don't wait till it's too late. Take some of your profit from the stock market now and solidify them with gold from Birch Gold. Throughout history, gold has maintained its value better than any other investment in the entire world. That's how stable and secure it is. Text Walsh to 989898 for a free zero obligation info kit on holding gold in a tax sheltered retirement account. Join the thousands of happy Birch Gold customers with countless five star reviews and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. I trust the professionals at Birch Gold. You should too. All you got to do again is text Walsh to 989898 and secure the gains that you've made while you can. Let's get now to the comment section. Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. Um, let's see. Angela says, I want to become a Daily Wire member just for your movie, Matt. Well, we appreciate that. And uh, lots of people telling me that, that they want to become a Daily Wire member to watch this film. And I hope for the sake of my own feelings that you're actually doing it. So go to what is a woman, because it's going to hurt my feelings if you don't, go to whatiswoman.com and sign up and become a member today. Um, let's see, Scott says, okay, Matt, I'll admit that the plane with the What Is a Woman banner flying behind it was impressive, but I have to mention the fact that I didn't see a single ash-breasted tit tyrant flying around that day. How could you possibly still believe that the ash-breasted tit tyrant community is not threatened by habitat loss? Well, they, they, uh, if, if you saw the, the footage of the Women's March, you, you saw plenty of the ash-breasted tit tie. But it turns out that they're flightless birds. They're much like uh, penguins. Uh, they don't fly. And they, they, in fact, have the physique of, a, of large, like large emperor penguins, it turns out. Um, Steve-O says, in reference to today's canceling, I'm an immigrant from Australia. I've been here for 20 years and call myself an American. Here's what I get asked all the time. Do you know Crocodile Dundee? Are you having a nice vacation or welcome to America? The interesting part is it's usually the libs that ask me why on earth I would want to leave Australia for the U.S. Conservatives will say Australia is a place they'd like to visit. I usually answer the former with for freedom. Americans are the most welcoming people on the planet. Stop with the nonsense. What on earth is wrong with people talk? What is wrong? What on earth is wrong with talking about where you're from? Have some fun with it. Another thing I get asked is if kangaroos hop down the city streets. I always go with yes and add in that uh, if you see a red kangaroo, you may be able to hitch a ride on it as they're 16 feet tall. That is, unless it hasn't killed you first. Yeah, but do kangaroos just hop down the street in Australia? That is, a, I'd like an, an actual answer to that question. Um, yeah, this is, this is the correct uh, attitude that any human being should have. 
And I say this, I mean, I was thinking about this yesterday. We did the daily cancellation about these leftist immigrants complaining when people ask them where they're from. And I'm saying how, how absurd that is to be, to be uh, offended by it. I say this as someone who, who infamously is not a big fan of small talk. But even though I'm not a big fan of it, see, that's, that's, this is a perfect example. I'm not a big fan of it, but I'm not offended when someone attempts it. And I also realize that my issues with small talk, those are my issues. So I don't have the right to actually be offended that anyone would dare try to strike up, strike up a, a small talk conversation. That's my own hang up, which I'm entitled to and which I will cling to, but I'm not going to make it your problem. And especially if you're an immigrant to this country and you're welcome into this country and people are showing an interest in where you're from and they want to know about your, the culture where you're from and the country where you're from, like, how about have a little bit of uh, gratitude for the fact that you've been welcomed and people are taking an interest? Would you actually prefer that you come to this country and then you're just ignored? Like, nobody cares? No, well, well, of course, as we discussed yesterday, they, the people that have this attitude, and this is, this is the way the left approaches these issues, which is that you know, sometimes they're in the mood to talk about themselves and their identity, and sometimes they aren't, and uh, you're supposed to know ahead of time and read their mind, and that's the way that's supposed to work. The value of the minivan, pickup, sedan, or whatever you drive probably appreciated significantly last year. Take care of your automotive investment and keep more of your money by buying the auto parts you need to maintain and repair your vehicle at rockauto.com. Rockauto.com only sells auto parts and related tools. Uh, they've been doing it for over 20 years. Their unique, intuitive catalog includes photos, specs, and installation tips that make it really easy to choose the correct parts for your specific vehicle and then install them as well. So they got all, all of it right there on their website. They not only have the auto parts you need, but will give you a selection of trusted name brands to choose from. You can pick brakes that match how you use your vehicle, whether that's for towing, racing, or just commuting to work. You can get suspension, exhaust, air conditioning, other kits that provide all the parts you need for a successful repair. RockAuto.com has lots of parts that you might expect would only be available at car dealerships if they're available at all. Uh, parts like the fan inside your seat that cools your tush. We got, I, you gotta put something else there, so I stopped reading that. That cools your tush. RockAuto.com, prices are always reliably low. That means they do not change prices based on what the market will bear, like many airlines and marketplace sites do. Their prices make it affordable for customers to keep their daily drivers and classics safely on the road. So go to RockAuto.com for your auto parts and write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that I sent you. Also, leading up to the two-year anniversary of George Floyd's death and the radical worldwide repercussions that followed, Candace Owens has taken her bold lens to the people and places that ignited the violent and racially divided aftermath. Join Candace as she goes beyond what you've been told by the media to bring the truth to light and expose the greatest lie ever told. The trailer for this explosive documentary drops tonight at 8 p.m. Central Time on Candace Owens' show. The greatest lie ever told, George Floyd and the rise of BLM, is only available to Daily Wire members. So subscribe today at thegreatestlie.com and tune in tonight to be the first to catch the exclusive trailer. You don't want to miss it. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. So a writer by the name of Michelle Saika highlights what she says is the worst land acknowledgement she's ever seen. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with this cutting-edge innovation in the field of white guilt, a land acknowledgement is something like an act of contrition that a Catholic might say after confessing his sins to the priest. Except in this case, the act of contrition is being offered to some randomly selected group of Indians who lived on the land in question at some arbitrary point in the past. Um, land acknowledgements are meant to acknowledge that we are allegedly on tribal land. So needless to say, talking about the worst land acknowledgement, it's like discussing the most unpleasant porta potty you've ever been in. I mean, these aren't, there aren't any good ones. They're, they're just varying degrees of sickening. The one presented here for consideration is from Vancouver Island University. And it says, Vancouver Island University acknowledges that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the, oh boy, the Snooney Muxu. Well, how do you do that? That's XW. How do you pronounce that? Anyway, territory of the Snuni Muxu people, and we thank them for allowing us to live, laugh, love, and learn here. Okay, I take it back. That, that is probably the worst. If only the pioneers who conquered these lands with their blood and sweat and toil could have known that a few hundred years hence, their descendants would be groveling before these Indian tribes and whispering to them, thank you for allowing us to live, laugh, and love, and do yoga here. Our ancestors probably would have just turned around and went home and said it's not worth the effort. 
Why bother bleeding and dying for a civilization that will one day be inherited by the most embarrassing, obsequious, effeminate weaklings to ever live on planet Earth? Perhaps that's the point of all of this. The left is punishing their ancestors by becoming everything their ancestors would hate. In fact, come to think of it, that is exactly the point. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Michelle provides another fun contender for the worst land acknowledgement. This one from the Washington State Department of Corrections. It reads, The Washington State Department of Corrections acknowledges that its facilities, offices, and operations are on the ancestral lands and customary territories of indigenous peoples, tribes, and nations. Corrections is, it, it thanks, gives thanks to the tribes for caring for these lands since time immemorial and honors its ongoing connection to these communities, past, present, and future. We welcome the opportunity to collaborate with the indigenous populations and communities and strive to work with our tribal partners to improve the lives of indigenous people and non-indigenous neighbors throughout the state. Okay, you're, you're a prison, so just calm down here. But these acknowledgements also come in video form, lucky for you. For instance, last week, the Aspen Ideas Festival kicked off with this quirky little disclaimer. Listen to this. Truth and acknowledgement are the foundation to healing and transformation. We begin this effort today by acknowledging that we are in the ancestral lands of native nations, including the Taino, the Calusa, the Tequesta, and today, the sovereign and unceded homelands of the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. Our communities and ways have existed long before the United States. We have survived attempted takeovers, the Indian Removal Act under Andrew Jackson, three Seminole Wars between 1814 and 1858, being hunted with bloodhounds, rounded up like cattle, and forced on the Trail of Tears. Okay, the Trail of Tears started in 1830. So that's nearly 200 years ago. My ancestors were dying in the potato famine around that time, but you don't hear me complaining about it. If you're carrying around grievances that date back two centuries to a time before you or your parents or your parents' parents or your parents' 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 grandparents' parents were alive, then that tells me that you have these grievances because you want them. They're an emotional tool that you like to use. Here's the thing. Most human beings on earth today, if they trace their lineage back 200 years, will find that their ancestors endured all manner of unspeakable horrors, deprivations, and sufferings. But only some of us go around talking about it all the time. Only some of us feel that our ancestors' struggles must be acknowledged to us as if we were the ones who suffered those things. But that wasn't even as bad as the acknowledgement that now, as of last year, is played before every home game for the Chicago Blackhawks hockey team. Listen to this. The Chicago Blackhawks acknowledge that the team, its foundation, and the spaces we maintain, work, and compete within stand upon the traditional homelands of the Miami, Sauk, Meskwaki, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We understand that this land holds immense significance for its original stewards, the native nations, and the peoples of this region. We would also like to recognize that our team's namesake, Sauk War Leader Blackhawk, serves as a continuous reminder of our responsibility to the Native American communities we live amongst and draw inspiration from. Yes, it's very important that we pay homage to the Ho-Chunk people before a hockey game. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting down to watch a sporting event and thought to myself, you know, it's not fair that we're all enjoying ourselves here and just completely ignoring the Ho-Chunks. Uh, it's just, I've said it so many times. Like, it's, it's my, my family, they're sick of me saying because I always say it. They also, of course, had to pay deference to uh, Sauk war leader Blackhawk, who was an Indian warlord born in the mid-1700s. It'd be quite rude to have a hockey match without mentioning an Indian warlord from 250 years ago, obviously. As a war leader, Black Hawk um, would have led raiding parties. Now, do you know what raiding parties did? They weren't throwing parties as we think of them today. I can tell you that. Okay, these weren't birthday parties. They were raiding parties. And raiding meant stealing from and terrorizing other tribes, often killing their men, kidnapping and raping their women and their children. Okay, that's what Indian tribes did. So when you hear about an Indian warlord... That's what he did. This is how they lived. 
And of course, you know, we're obsessed with problematic. We, 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 we got we to gotta sift through the lives of all the historical figures, tear down the statues. We're worried about problematic historical figures. But the only historical figures we're still allowed to honor are Indian warlords from 200 years ago that raped and killed children. This is what happened in Indian tribes. It was the case everywhere without exception. They stole from each other, they killed, they kidnapped, they conquered, and so on, over and over again, century upon century. This is one of the many reasons why this whole um, land acknowledgement thing is, is ludicrous. Whose land is it? Who are we supposed to be acknowledging? Just the most recent tribe to occupy it before white people showed up? But that tribe stole it from another, and that one from a different tribe, and on and on, stretching back into the unknown and unrecorded past. This is not whataboutism. This is, first of all, a simple historical reality that needs to be acknowledged. Speaking of acknowledgments, it's also a logical problem for the, for the White Guild Brigade. If this is not really our land, if we occupy it illegitimately because we conquered it, then the same must be said of whatever tribe we took it from and of whatever tribe they took it from, etc. The only way to escape this problem is to suggest that the white man should be held to a higher standard. But why is that? The only way to justify a higher moral standard for the white man is to claim that the white man is inherently morally superior. But I'm pretty sure that's not what they mean to say or what they want us to take away from this. Which means, then, that the same historical standard applies to everybody which completely destroys the basis for all of this groveling and apologizing. This land was soaked in the blood of conquest long before anyone with white skin ever stepped foot on these shores. The white man joined the fray, joined the fight, didn't start it, or least of all, invent the whole concept. After all, what does the word indigenous even mean? According to the Collins Dictionary, it means, quote, People or things that belong to the country in which they are found, rather than coming there or being brought there from another country. Okay, well, that means that either um, no one is indigenous here, or we all are. Because everybody who lives here now, every, no exceptions here, everyone who lives in the Americas is descended from a group that came here at some point in the past. Period. Now, your ancestors may have came here, come here a thousand years ago. They may have come here 200 years ago, two years ago. But we all came here. A nation of immigrants. Isn't that what the left always likes to say? Now, it's not actually true because the European settlers came here before it was an actual nation. I mean, they came when it was unsettled wilderness, which means they weren't technically immigrants. But um, we did all come here. That's true. That doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't defend and control our borders. No, because once you claim and settle a territory, you have to defend it. If you won't or you can't, it will cease to exist. If you have land that you won't or can't defend, you will not have it for very long. That's the law of history. That's the way of the world. The Indian tribes played this same game and understood the rules. It's only we modern people who are stupid and shallow enough to be scandalized by it. By the way, that land acknowledgement from the university has now um, necessitated its own acknowledgement of the sins committed by the acknowledgement. Because the university posted after that, they said, we thank Michelle Saika for bringing to our attention an unofficial land acknowledgement on our website. We apologize to those who are negatively impacted by this language. Apologizing for an apology. And if anybody, anybody was negatively impacted by the apology for the apology, they'll no doubt apologize for the apology for the apology. They are stuck now in a self-perpetuating cycle of groveling, a vortex of cringe. This is the inevitable end result. It's where it always leads. And it's why land acknowledgments and all who give them are today canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring, our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vodowski. Our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. And hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. The new White House press secretary humiliates herself during her first day on the job. Democrats exploit the Buffalo Massacre and the fight for the future of the GOP plays out in Pennsylvania. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. 